Okay, I'm gonna call this meeting to order at 6.42 p.m. Apologize for the delay. We were in executive session before. In accordance with chapter 20 of the acts of 2021, signed by Governor Baker on June 16, 2021, suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, general laws, chapter 30A. This meeting of the North Reading School Committee is being conducted with some remote participation. While in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted and a quorum of the school committee will be in person. This meeting is concurrently being presented through a Google Meet and or by a live broadcast by NORCAM to allow the public and any school committee members who cannot attend to participate. Although all the school committee is in person, so we will not do roll call votes. We'll just vote as we normally do. Thank you everybody for coming tonight. <clears throat> Before we begin, I would actually just like to wish a happy birthday to our superintendent, Dr. Daly. <laughs> <laughs> He didn't think I knew, but no place did. I'd rather be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you thought your birthday stunk, guys, you're at a he's at a school committee meeting all night, so we appreciate you taking the time tonight with us, Dr. Daly. Thank you. Okay, we will begin with public input. If any members of the public would like to speak about something that is not on the agenda, please raise your hand, unmute, in some way call out. Seeing none, <clears throat> we'll move on to the student report, and we have a late replacement, but. I see Shivani Srikant on the call. Shivani, would you like to give the student report? We can't hear you, Shivani. can't hear you, Shivani. <coughs> is, our, is our thing on? I don't see ours on anymore. Oh, I think it went out. Ours went out. <coughs> I'll turn my volume up. So maybe while we're calling in, do you want to try? Dr. Daly just turned his on. We can. All set? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Awesome. Um, yes, so I'm a bit of a last minute replacement, but I'm just going to present a little bit about um, the past couple of weeks at the high school and the upcoming week, um, all of which are pretty busy. Um, the last two weeks, we had Spirit Week, where each of the grades had three dress up to show school spirit. We had um, Western Wednesday, Throwback Thursday, America Monday, um, Pajama Day Tuesday, and all of this was leading up to a pep rally on Wednesday. Um, so pep rally was held outside this year for COVID concerns, um, and it honored the band who made it to the finals of the New England Scholastic Band Competition. Um, it also honored the color guard, all of the fall sports, and their captains, as well as the people who won all league championships. Um, there were also some games and a speech to commemorate the varsity football team and their Thanksgiving game against Linfield, which they won 28 to 25. Um, in addition, the senior class has been putting on fundraisers. Um, the most recent one is called Sponsor the Seniors, and this is our way to raise money for prom and graduation, um, where some of the fundraising have been hindered by COVID. Um, I think we're a little bit above a quarter of the way to our goals, so we're continuing to raise money for that. Um, we also did recently get measured for caps and gowns, um, and in addition, the senior and junior girls who signed up for Powder Puff were able to play their game last Tuesday after school, and the seniors won that. Um, on more of the winter sports athletic front, um, winter sports like swim, basketball, and track started up today, and the football team will be playing in the Division Five state championships this Wednesday night at Gillette Stadium against Swampscott. Um, and then moving on to kind of maskers and the drama side of things, maskers has been working tirelessly towards putting together the musical after having been unable to perform shows um, for the past year. So Newsies will be playing at the Performing Arts Center this Friday and Saturday and next weekend as well. And I think tickets might be on sale um, already. And then moving on to some of the more academic stuff going on at the high school. Um, seniors have started getting college admissions acceptances, especially from the Southern schools who tend to have rolling deadlines. Um, and in addition, regular decision application deadlines are coming up for most seniors as well. Um, and then moving on to kind of the club agenda, Interact has started their leaf making project. This provides a lot of community service opportunities for sophomores, juniors, and seniors. 
Um, and it also provides like leaf breaking services to people who have disabilities and the elderly in town. So it's a really great way to kind of get back to the community. Um, and then Team Cure has started to put together their care packages for the year for children who have cancer. And this is also a really great way that high schoolers kind of give back to the community. Um, so kind of with all of the high school affairs wrapped up, um, I did have a some student work to show. It's kind of unwieldy, but I can like hold it up. So this is just kind of a ceramics project. Um, it's a mortar and a pestle, and it's kind of cool because ceramics is a class that a lot of seniors tend to take um, as a way to kind of wind down, especially with all the busy college applications and everything. So it's a fun art class that is mostly populated by seniors and. Um, we make like mortars and pestles and game projects and it's a really great way to kind of relax and hang out with friends. So um, yeah, that's just some student work and that's kind of it for what's been going on over the past month. Excellent. Now, Dr. Dr. Daly, you're, you're, you're muted. muted. Do you want to use your microphone if we can hear? Can we, <coughs> Shivy, can you hear me okay on this microphone? Okay, because we're, we're having technical difficulties in the room, so we're going to use Dr. Daly's computer. So any questions for, our, for Shivy? I don't really either. I mean, I, I think a lot going on at the high school. I have tickets to Newsies this weekend. Very excited about that. Can't get to Gillette, but really excited for that. Um, and please keep us posted on any... Are, are you a senior this year, Shivy? Are you a senior? Mute it, Dr. Daly. What? You're cutting out. I can't. Oh, hang on. <laughs> Are you a senior this year? Yes, yes. Oh, please keep us posted about your college decisions as well. Yeah, I will. Definitely. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I think we're going to probably have some technical issues, but we appreciate you coming and we will move on. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Chevy. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Phone is coming on. We're going to let Dr. Daly or let Michael sign in. <coughs> Actually, Dr. Daly, do you want to unmute? Do you want to unmute and then? Okay, why don't you, why don't you start? Do you want to do the COVID update? So we're gonna or do, or do you want to skip to the, do you want to do some of the? We have our student uh, presentation okay. here. Okay, we'll wait. Let's just get. Press star six to unmute. The call is being recorded. Great. Ms. Conan, can you hear us? Michael, you, I think Ms. Conan, might, if you can hear us, can you give me a thumbs up? I think you're okay. unmuted. Hang on. You unmuted yourself. Ms. Conan, can you hear us? Can you give us a thumbs up if you can hear us? <coughs> awesome. Thank you so hey. much. So we're I good to just, go. Okay. Yeah. So then we're going to go North Reading High School proposal. Is that who we have here today? We do. Okay. We have the Culinary Club. <coughs> Welcome. I almost forgot about you. You were right behind the stand here. So. <laughs> nice to have him in person, right? <coughs> Absolutely. <I know. coughs> um. So. Uh, we're here to propose a new club called the Culinary Club. And my name is Amy Ho. I'm a senior at NIHS. Um, I'm of Vietnamese and Chinese descent. And I also participate in other clubs such as Eco Team, Interact Club, Social Activism Club. And the reason I'm proposing this club is because I've always loved cooking and I wanted to share that experience with others as well as gain experience and more knowledge around other cultures. Um, I'm Terfa Safraz. I'm also a senior at NRHS. I'm of Pakistani descent. And um, my involvement in other clubs is that I'm an officer in it, both Interact and Eco Team and participate in SLAM. My um, relationship with cooking is that my mom's a caterer, so I've grown up in that culture and want to help pass around those tips to my team. <laughs> I'm uh, Ms. Laura Hargrove. I'm an English teacher here as well as a public speaking teacher for freshman seminar. 
And um, both Amy and Turka came and asked me if I would be interested in being the advisor. I said, absolutely. Uh, I am a great British Bake Off wannabe. <laughs> so I'm very happy to uh, see what they're up to, and I'm, I'm really proud of them. Um, so, what is Culinary Club? Culinary Club is a club that Turka and I and Ms. Hargrove helped um, design to help students create like a safe space to learn cooking. And instead of relying on store-bought food or fast food, we want to help them understand how to cook and the basic steps of cooking like a basic nutritious meal. Mm -hmm. Um, our mission is to mainly focus on um, helping people with their dietary interests, helping um, tackle with the right nutritious meal, and also providing a meal that will stay under budget and help them actually sustain a lifestyle without relying on fast food. Hey, Dr. Daly, do you want to share that on the screen for anybody? Yeah. I know we had the presentation in the. Uh, no, I do have it ready to go. In the back end. Sorry, go ahead, guys. Sorry. <laughs> so, uh, Amy and Tarf have already taken the steps to collect student signatures, um, and a proposal has been sent to Mr. Lepret, the principal at the high school. Um, they've worked out safety uh, information as well as meeting procedures, and that I think we'll continue with on the next slide. Um, so our meetings, in-person, we will have in-person meetings and online meetings. For the in-person meetings, because of COVID and health regulations, we won't be cooking in school, but instead we'll be using that time to come up with new recipes and um, prepare ingredients and share experiences and like cultures and what dishes we like. Um, each meeting is expected to look different. And for online meetings, because there's no access to kitchens like in school, We'll be using our kitchens at home, and in order to match CDC guidelines with COVID-19 protocols, we'll be cooking at each other's houses, but with a maximum capacity of three or four people. This is a sample of something that they've come up with. This is our club meeting for next week. It'll be our first Google Meet, and this is a recipe that Amy has brought with, uh, brought to us, and this is a, a sample of the recipe card that she also <coughs> created and illustrated. <laughs> so we, uh, they are very, very um, smart in making sure that everybody stays safe during COVID. Unfortunately, our fundraising opportunities and, and ability to showcase their cooking skills are uh, diminished slightly this year, but hopefully that will change in future years. Um, the future is of the club, what we're hoping is that hopefully when uh, COVID is reduced, we'll be able to actually cook with each other or cook more and cultivate more. But for now, what we're deciding on is that we're just going to run th uh, things through Google Meets and some in-person meetings. And as for the upcoming like officer elections, we would just give them like a rough outline of what we've planned for safety and other stuff like that. Do you want to mention the videos that we've shared? Sure. Or that you've shared. <laughs> um, for, we've already actually had our first meeting. Um, and through that, we went over kitchen safety, and my mom provided really awesome videos of her showing people how to use a daily knife. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Comments, questions? <coughs> Janine. I think this is an incredibly <coughs> brilliant idea. I cannot tell you how many times my kids come home. I haven't had a home cooked meal. I'm so sick of ramen. You know, if I see another Domino's pizza, I'm just going to like bust. So, um, and, and they've seen me cook. So, you know, they have a rough idea, but it's, it, you know, 
they don't necessarily have the ability to cook sometimes when you know until they're a junior or senior um, but even just like in the microwave you can sometimes make masterpieces so I think this is a really smart idea and thank you for bringing it thank you uh, Chris uh, sure I um, yeah I mean I think the skills that people need to hit adulthood with and like knowing how to cook is such a off forgotten and overlooked skill that is like one of the most essential things to life so I think it's great that you've got interest going just as this is you know kind of developing out and uh, and you guys seem like the perfect people to do it the, um, the motivation and I think that this is one of those times where as annoying as it can be to have only three to four people in the same kitchen I, I, I understand that limitation it makes things probably a little bit less fun but at the same time opens up this avenue where now <coughs> You know, if there was 14 people in a kitchen, really, there's not a lot of people to be doing except looking at. So there's kind of a, a, a good way to take that. So uh, I love the creativity and coming up with that kind of solution. Um, given that this is, you know, cooking and that means access to knives and fires, is, are there permission slips that have to go with this, or is there some kind of parent approval in the process? Um, we're hoping to do like a parent approval and permission slip thing, especially since the school is mainly made up of. Well, it's like a range of 14 to 18 year olds. So you have to like make sure that they're being safe. But otherwise we're hoping that um, with the help of our advi advisors, we'll be able to like limit the amount of hazards happening. Great. I was just gonna say that when I was back in school, and it was middle school at the time, we used to have home economics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it, it's depressing to me sometimes that we don't have something like that, mm -hmm. whether it's middle school or high school, where we had a cooking class and also a carpentry <coughs> class. And it was just those life skills that, you know, just aren't a focus um, in today's education. So I, I think it's refreshing, and I, I, I'm really happy that you put it forward. Yeah, it is too bad that there, I, I mean, I guess there aren't any cooking facilities for students in the building, uh, but, uh, or are there? Uh, not, yeah. not, not at a large scale like this, yeah. no. Which is, which is too bad, but uh, it does sound like you have a good solution, so. Yeah. And, and I, I agree, I mean, I think, I, I did a home and careers class I was thinking about the other day because I was sewing some things. <laughs> yeah, we had sewing. I, I, I learned how to sew and <laughs> kept that skill. Um, so I have a couple questions and, and a suggestion. My first question is, so I, th I think you've done a great job in how you're gonna do it during COVID. I'm curious, once COVID maybe is under control a little bit more and things open up, would the plan be to do more at school using the, the, the cafeteria here? I saw in one of the forums, you talked about taste buds in North Andover. So I'm curious what the long-term plan would be if you can congregate again. Our long-term plan for when uh, COVID isn't as prevalent, we're hoping that um, we'll still try to cultivate by using kitchens of um, people's homes, but we're also hoping to do more field trips and as well as like fundraisers to help fund those field trips where we're going to places like Taste Buds to be able to work together since the school doesn't necessarily have um, a big uh, kitchen or area to be able to do this, such things. Okay, and <clears throat> my suggestion would be, and this may be an odd one, but I would love to see like the senior center. I mean, if you could either maybe even open it up to some seniors sometimes cooking with them, or even maybe put something on for the seniors as part of it. Like if you did, you know, a cooking event and did something with the senior center, which is here, I think that would be, you know, a, a great opportunity. I've, I've spoken at times with, with some people in the, in the senior center and, I know they would love opportunities to interact with the students here. So that might be an opportunity. Just again, I think right now is going to be very limited during COVID, but in the future, if there's a you know a chance to cook and maybe make some food and you know maybe do that in conjunction with the senior center, I think that might be a really nice opportunity. With a two-way street there, with learning their you know them teaching <coughs> you guys. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Janine. Um, I know. Jeez. When my kids were younger, and I'm going to say how long ago that was, Lynn Clemens, I believe, used to run a children's cooking class um, on the top floor of the, the meeting house, you know, above the, the seniors. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that kitchen is still available, but you could probably reach out to her. I'm pretty sure she's still at um, Town Hall, right? Yep. 
Yeah. Part of the rack. So they might have a kitchen available upstairs for y'all to cook with too. Excellent. Okay. The uh, online versions can other people join, like to learn. Would you um, be open to that at some point? <coughs> Even to record some of them might be cool too. I, I, say, I, I could see, I see some Norcam content coming up here. Yeah. <laughs> it could be it could be great because it's. I also love it, and I've learned a lot of just watching YouTube stuff, and, and it's amazing what you can pick up. So, you know, maybe people that can't come to the club meetings, but they can still learn from you because it sounds like uh, you've got some great recipes and ideas to share. So, yeah. good stuff. And Mr. McGowan just said, I mean. He, he's the rep for NORCAM right now. I was in the past. I know they're always looking for content. So if you ever want a live audience, <laughs> they, would, they would probably tape you guys. <clears throat> okay. I think it's a great idea. Um, can we have a motion to approve the Culinary Club? I will make a motion to um, uh, approve the Culinary Club. I don't know how to go. Second. Okay. Any more comments? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed. Unanimous. Five to zero. Thank you, ladies. Thank you, Thank you guys Thank you. so much. Okay. Job. <coughs> you can feel free to come back with samples. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We should have yeah. made we should have made that a contingent on our approval. <laughs> yes. Thank you, ladies. <coughs> okay. So, do we want to move to? Do you want to skip, skip to student services now? Sure. Dr. Daly. I mean, is there anybody here for the ESSER? There's nobody here for ESSER, right? No. There's nobody here. Okay. So we'll go to, I see uh, Mrs. Conan on here. So I'm going to, I assume I'm, I don't know if I'm turning over to you or, or to Mrs. Conant, but. I would say to Mrs. Conant. Okay. Mrs. Conant, would you like to lead us through the presentation on student services? Sure. So can everyone hear me okay? We can. Great. First, thank you for making some time to have us come tonight and present. I'm really excited to be here tonight with my colleague, Mr. Michael Rosa who is our coordinator of school counseling services. And we're excited to share with you just a quick snapshot among the, the highlights, highlights of the work that's being done across the district <coughs> for it, our students' social and emotional learning needs. Um, Mr. Rosa works very closely with the school counselors across the district, and he's very knowledgeable around school-based counseling practices. He's up to date with research and very grateful to have him as a member of the student services team. Um, and we're very lucky to have him in the district. So I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Rosa and we will go from there. Thank you, Ms. Conant. Um, just please, you know, don't hesitate to um, interrupt me, anybody, if, uh, if I have any audio issues. Um, so far, so good though. Uh, so as Ms. Conan said, I'm Mike Rosa. I am the coordinator of school counseling services. I have presented to the school committee several times in the past, but it's been uh, several years at least. So I, I might be a new face um, to some. So thank you again for having me. Um, one thing I wanted to say is that uh, I am going to be highlighting some of the work that the school counselors have been doing and mostly this year and um, it's the work they've been doing to support students needs and you'll see that I am going to mostly focus on uh, the social and emotional needs of students while also touching upon um, some other areas and when I'm referring to school counselors or school counseling staff I just wanted to say that uh, that really um, includes our school psychologists, our school adjustment counselors, and our guidance counselors, uh, kind of the three different types of school counselors that the uh, district employs. If it's okay with everybody, if it, if it makes the most sense, um, I was going to share my screen so you kind of can, everyone can see the, um, the presentation um, at, at its fullest here. Uh, so let me see if I have luck doing that here. While Mike is doing that, I'll just frame this a little bit more too for members of the school committee. I know most of the time when I come to school committee, I'm usually talking about special education. So 
So I just want to kind of share that this presentation is not specific to special education. This is for all students in the district. So just want you to keep that in mind as you hear about all the great work that's being done. Thank you. Okay, so um, again, please let me know. I'm sharing my screen and uh, I've, I've lost uh, sight of everybody. So don't hesitate to uh, stop me if, if we're experiencing any issues. So I wanted to start um, with um, some work being done at the elementary level. Um, as some of you may recall, we've added a school adjustment counselor who's focused on the elementary level this year. And we've asked that person to really be focused on proactive, preventative, uh, universal support. So this school adjustment counselor, and uh, I figured I, I should at least mention her name is Alexandra Alexa. And um, she's spending at least a day and a half at each of the elementary schools per week. And she's delivering K through five classroom lessons focused on social and emotional learning. And just to kind of illustrate exactly what that means, I have a sampling of uh, some of the lessons she's already been able to uh, conduct at, at the three different elementary schools. So she's focused on things like coping skills and stress management and kindness and um, conflict resolution and uh, recognizing and regulating emotions. I actually got to see her conduct a, a lesson um, at the Hood School on recognizing and regulating emotions uh, with third graders, and it was it was really great to see how invested the students were in the uh, in the lesson and how much they were participating. Um, uh, you know, indications are that she's providing some really great uh, lessons for the students. The secondary level, um, like the elementary level, we added a school adjustment counselor um, to the staff. And uh, this person is serving as the clinical coordinator for the high school bridge program and for the newly uh, established uh, middle school bridge program. So this person is kind of a 0 0.5 at both uh, at the high school and then a 0 0.5 at the middle school. Um, in case folks aren't familiar with the Bridge Program, it's a program that assists students with their transition back to school after they've experienced a prolonged absence. So we've had this program for several years at this point at the high school, and uh, it can serve as students, you know, um, ranging from those who have maybe experienced a concussion or a different medical issue, are transitioning back to school after a surgery, um, and certainly can serve as students um, who have had to miss school due to uh, mental health reasons. Um, so it's been really nice to um, expand that into the um, middle school grades too. And they have serviced, um, they've had about five referrals of students um, to date thus far this year in the middle school, I mean, I'm sorry, in the high school has served, um, I think we're up over 10 students as of today. Um, so students can come back into school this the school adjustment counselor, you know, will meet with them, um, conduct a transition meeting to help them back into school if there are um, some emotional concerns. Um, this the counselor will meet with the, uh, the student to help uh, process those. And there's also uh, academic coordinators that help the student get back on track uh, academically. Also, having um, this person help over. Uh, see you know the the emotional needs of students involved with bridge has been really helpful because it has um taken that burden off some of our other counselors for example our high school school adjustment counselor used to kind of you know oversee our bridge program and do everything else that um she does and i think on my next slide i have an example um yes yeah our um so this is just a sampling of some other initiatives happening across the district and uh, Lindsay Gervino, who is our high school school adjustment counselor, um, again, not having to serve as the uh, coordinator for the bridge program, has been able to do things like what I have with the uh, first bullet point here. She um, She's trying to be proactive. She's practicing uh, mindfulness with students in the high school bridge program three times a week during our um, power block. It is really looking to expand that into some additional classroom settings. I know she's been in discussions with some of our special education staff about going into um, some of their support rooms to, uh, you know, help teach mindfulness skills to students 
And she's been doing sort of a self-study of the mindful schools curriculum and enacting that um, during these sessions. One of our guidance counselors, Jenna Grossman, who is um, serving as a long-term substitute covering a maternity leave, has jumped right in and got very involved um, with the counseling department. And she's formed a partnership with our media center specialist, um, Ms. Kim Brown, to run a career speaker series for students. So we're really excited about this. They polled the high school students and received over 90 responses, which I was really excited about. Um, and what they ask students is what type of speakers would they like to have in, what types of careers are students interested in learning more about. So they have all kinds of feedback um, about that and they're, they're going to get that program up and running so that students can see, you know, people from different careers talk about how they became what they uh, became. Our middle school counselors have continued some efforts that they started last year. Um, they've been refining their electronic guidance check-in form to collect data from um, uh, about what students' concerns are when they're making an appointment. So students can write from their Chromebook, make an appointment with their um, guidance counselor, and they're asked to share uh, what their concerns relate to. Obviously, this is private information, but what it allows the middle school counselors to do is to you know look at what maybe some common concerns are. And then when the middle school holds um, such days as their care days, uh, the counselors can have, you know, programming that's targeted, targeted for some uh, common concerns uh, that they're seeing at the middle school. So it's a nice, nice way for students to be able to sort of electronically make an appointment with their counselor, but also a nice way to collect data on what um, some of the common concerns might be amongst the student body. Uh, the elementary school psychologists are continuing some work that they started last year um, that was, you know, particularly important during hybrid learning, but that they found was um, really useful, and that is creating uh, digital resources that students can access at different times. Um, so, for example, um, the school psychologists at the elementary school had each created these virtual offices that they're kind of continuing to curate resource, resources for, excuse me, and um, they students can enter these virtual offices, you know, when, when they need to, and they can enter like, you know, they can look at resources, uh, calming areas where they might learn about some breathing exercises they can do, reading rooms um, where there's uh, resources on, you know, uh, you know, different books around me, managing anxiety and, um, you know, whatever sort of so other social emotional skills. Um, and they also have information on identifying and uh, regulating emotions. So it's just uh, something students can access kind of 24 seven, and particularly the older students or can take a little break during class to um, access uh, these, you know, virtual counseling areas uh, during an indoor recess, those types of things. So those have been really um, neat to look at, and it's it's something that uh, they've decided to continue to build this year, even as we return to uh, full-time in-person learning. And then I just wanted to finish with some, um, some things that we have coming up, uh, particularly in the short term. So in alignment to some of the discussions we've been having around NRPS, uh, 2025, the, the strategic plan, uh, several counselors have uh, goals that they're pursuing this year around universal mental health screenings for students. So just some basic questions uh, we're looking into is, you know, what different types of screening tools are available um, and really identifying best practices when it comes to um, mental health screening. That's something you want to kind of really design with the with the, starting at the end and coming back to the beginning, meaning that you want to make sure you have, um, you know, support and needed resources uh, built for students that if you do screen, you know, groups of students or even, you know, grade levels or even, even a whole school that you have um, appropriate resources to, uh, you know, be able to refer students to. So, takes sort of a, a lot of, you know, planning and, and mapping, um, but that's something that a few of us have goals um, on that we're working on this year. Um, a couple of the high school's guidance counselors are developing additional seminars for post-secondary planning for members of our junior class 
So that would be some uh, programming we'd be carrying out in addition to uh, the traditional programming we have for those students. Um, a couple of other counselors are actually have goals around developing uh, information sessions for students interested in pursuing careers in the trades. So uh, pre-COVID, we um, had built a few uh, information seminars, had a few speakers come in uh, for these students, and we're really trying to sort of build that back up uh, for students, even though we hover around, uh, you know, a 90% uh, college attendance rate, uh, both for four-year and two-year colleges, uh, that still means that, you know, somewhere around one in, one in 10 of our students is planning some other path uh, toward um, building a career. And a lot of those students are looking at the, uh, the various trades. Um, and then also we have some uh, meetings, some as soon as the Friday, um, coming up with some uh, what I'm going to call community-based resources. Um, this Friday we're going to be meeting with the NAN Project in the Elliott uh, Community Services. Uh, the NAN Project is related to Elliott Community Services, and it's a nonprofit that provides uh, training in schools. It'll come in and talk to students about um, really suicide and mental health awareness and how to support a friend who uh, might be going through a difficult time. So we're going to be meeting with them to see what they might be able to offer um, our students. And Elliott Community Services is our local um, emergency services provider, meaning that when we have a student who is experiencing a crisis, we can refer um, our students and families to them they even have something called um, a mobile crisis unit that will come to uh, people's houses when they have the staffing available anyways and um, do uh, crisis assessment and intervention to see whether they can help you know a student stabilize if they if the student needs a referral to um, more intensive services etc so we're going to meet with them just we've been using them for quite a few years but and we thought it was time to really um, meet with one of their outreach coordinators and talk about what other services might be available, um, especially in this time. So uh, we have a, a you know that meeting coming with them, and we also have a meeting scheduled for about a it's about a week and a half out with Mindwise, which is a group that is now running the Signs of uh, Suicide program, and so we, we're just looking to learn more about that program, its costs. Um, in, in what sort of that program brings to a school if uh, if we have them in or were trained to uh, carry out that program. So just a few more sort of um, exciting, um, you know, needed uh, initiatives coming forward. So that was um, everything I had for my presentation. I'm going to, let me stop my screen sharing. Certainly if, um, if people have questions, I'm more than happy to uh, try and answer those. Thank you, Mr. Rosa. Okay, I'll thank turn you to the committee. Any questions, comments? Looking around, Mr. McGowan. Yeah, uh, thank, <coughs> thanks, Mr. Rosa. I, I was really glad to hear about some of the work because we've, you know, been able to fund some of these positions and it's great to, to see the work that's being done. Um, I guess one question I have is, uh, I guess a little bit about measuring outcomes and, and especially as you know the, the as we look a couple years down the road and look to continue funding some of these positions you know uh, um, being able to point to specific outcomes or specific data that that that, that will help but make that case I don't uh, what kind of work are you doing in that area thank you yeah so we are looking um, with our our bridge programs, for example. We um, we track data pretty closely with that program, and we look at obviously like number of students that we're serving, um, the time that they're spending in the bridge program. Um, you know how I don't want to say how quickly we can help them sort of integrate back into class, but ultimately that's the goal is to get them back into their um, academics learning. So we'll we'll have data on that too. Um, I think it's also looking at, you know, things like overall a, a attendance data um, to see how that, you know, might um, 
impact. Uh, I always say that what I found before is students would return from hospitalizations and you would we would certainly meet and come up with a plan for them to catch up, but I had it it was difficult not to think that by the third block of the day they're already overwhelmed with the amount of work they have to do and stuff like that. So I think it's gonna be looking at that that type of data. Um, you know, are students able to integrate back to class pretty quickly? How many students are we serving? Is is this, you know, a needed service? Um I think we even sometimes look at does it help with um, lowering special education referrals to some degree because we're it's a it's an intervention that can be implemented pretty quickly um, in in again hopefully keeping the student from falling behind and and, and experience other problems. Um, I know um, some other data we'll be able to look at is with. Um, I know with like some of the classroom uh, things that are going on, um, we're often using like pre and post data to try and show student learning gains um, after a particular, you know, lesson just always to, I mean, it's just good teaching practice anyways to um, do the kind of these formative assessments and, and figure out what, what students are gaining. So those are some examples of uh, some of the data we are and will continue to collect. I see Mrs. Conan unmuting, so I'm guessing she wants to Comment. Mm -hmm. yeah. I was just going to also comment on that with respect to special education referrals in the bridge program. Mm -hmm. That's a very, that's a really clear data point to utilize with the bridge program. I can think of a couple of examples without getting into details, but um, students who were out um, periodically off and on and we were able to reintegrate them back to the bridge program and support them that way. And without that bridge program, teams were thinking about, are we gonna need to move into an out of district placement? So that's a very clear way that we can measure that intervention. So I've seen firsthand clear outcome from the bridge program. It's great to have that program and so valuable to have it now at the middle school as well. So. We really appreciate all the advocacy of the school committee in helping to get these positions in place. Um, and it's, it's because of that that we're able to sort of shift gears and work proactively now as opposed to just reacting to problems as they come. So we really appreciate all the advocacy and support that you've given to these positions. Thanks. Thank, thank you very much. <coughs> Mr. McGowan stole my main question, so the only <laughs> the only follow up on that one, I would, and then I have one other initial comment. But the follow up on that is, is, I'd just be very curious to see at the elementary level in particular, you know, how to evaluate that part of it, like you know the the role and then the classrooms there. Um, and again, I, I think it's just we have to see how it goes, but I think there's a need for it. Whenever we've talked about COVID, we've talked a lot about social emotional learning. We've talked a lot about you know, gaps when, when students come back and how, you know, students are dealing with it. So I think, I think at least in this district, we were forward thinking and we had some of these positions on the agenda for a while. We were able to fund some of them. So it'd be, you know, it, uh, good to see going forward how, how that helps. The <clears throat> other more broad question, and this will not be worded very well, but <clears throat> I'm just curious, a lot of what we're getting into with these positions are you know, medical, there, there are students that might have support outside of the school district. And I'm just curious how the school support interacts with general health care or a student, you know, own physicians, like what are our obligations versus, you know, what should be medical in nature and, you know, kind of where that line is. And again, there's not a great question there, but I'm just curious how these physicians would interact with a student's outside supports? I think it's a great question. Um, and, you know, the process for that would really be, we would obviously always be looking at these things on a case-by-case -case basis to determine who is the most appropriate person to be contacting the outside support. Is it the school psychologist? Is it the school adjustment counselor? And then with parent permission, we would get a signed release and we would be able to facilitate those conversations um, and that is pretty common practice in the district that I've observed. Um, you know, I think probably I see it more on the special education side of things, um, just a little bit more involved on that side. Um, 
but Mike can probably speak to this too um, in terms of, you know, working with collateral contacts and outside team members that it's pretty standard practice um, that I think the district, we do a really good job with that. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a great question. Um, and I think pre COVID I'd have a slightly different answer than post COVID, but, and I'll explain what I mean by that, but um, the, the bridge, clinical coordinator, it's actually a large part of his job. Um, we are often receiving students um, back uh, after experiencing some mental health difficulty. So some students may, um, it may have been decided that in addition to if they have a counselor outside of school, they may needed, they may have needed to attend what they call like a, a partial program, a day program where they receive mental health support for the course of like a week or two during most of the day so they don't attend um, school. Those used to be that you would go in person and then, you know, come home in the afternoon like school. Right now they're all sort of uh, virtual, but as you might imagine, um, you know, having a student come back from a program like that or from a, a residential facility that they might have spent a, a week or two at, it's just really important for us to coordinate, um, you know, what were the, the concerns that, you know, had the student attending that program in the first place? What concerns should we, we be aware of? What are some possible diagnoses on the board, um, so to say? And um, just trying to really work to help that student integrate back to school while coordinating with the um, outside providers. What, what I meant by saying something slightly different pre-COVID, post-COVID is that, you know, you, you probably doesn't go uh, past a week or two that, you know, some, uh, you know, you read an article in the Globe or, or somewhere else about um, there really is a, a crisis, I feel like right now with with mental health and the lack of um, uh, access to, you know, to mental health outside of school. I think a lot of people in a good way sought out, you know, assistance during the pandemic. But what you're finding is right now there's not enough counselors and we have these we have families who are telling us they're on these wait lists for six months. Um, et cetera. So I think the school's role is, you know, uh, school adjustment counselor is a good, a good uh, title in some ways in that, you know, working with students who might be experiencing mental health problems and mostly looking at it from a framework of helping them adjust to school the best they can. But unfortunately, right now, um, you know, so many students are getting their primary, you know, if, if that's the right term, mental health care through schools. Um, and so, you know, while we can't, you know, we don't have students, you know, come in in the old Freudian sense and lay on couches and, and things like that, um, a lot of students are having their first connection with, you know, someone that can help them with mental health through the school. And then some students, because of uh, not being able to find outside providers right now, are, are getting most of their quote unquote care through the school. I think that's a case right there to be made for the existence of the program and the, and the yeah. people. Well, and, and again, these, with any of these positions, there's what you can do proactively, but there's also a, a situation where you can't, you have to plan for what you don't know is going to happen. You can't, you can't expect to get the services when you need them later on if you haven't invested in the program to begin with. And I think that's what we've always tried to do is be proactive here, be prepared for whatever comes up, Hopefully, to be per perfectly honest, hopefully some of this is, is money that is not needed and that we don't have situations that occur. But if they do happen, we have to be prepared for them. And so I, I appreciate that we have them here. I appreciate the leadership of, you know, Mr. Rosa and Ms. Conant. Um, you know, I've, I've always felt we have some great staff in this district and very happy that you guys could spend some time with us tonight and explain it. It, it is not by any means my forte or something that I really well understand so i appreciate you know the uh the lesson every time that you guys come and present to us so thank you very much i don't know if anybody else has any other questions or dr daly comment question yeah, i just want to echo that and thank you know, miss corn and mr rosa for their time and for the great leadership um really visioning this program pre-covid advocating for these positions a part of our budget and our vision for several years and um as it's come you know with 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 post-COVID coming back to school and really needing it immediately. 
it's been it's been amazing. And, and just to the bridge program, I know a lot of what we're doing is for all students, and, and everyone can have access. And we're talking more about universal screeners and trying to find that uh, piece of, of mental health that, that works for everyone. But also the real focus there, I can't say how many parents have said that without that bridge program, their child may not have, have been able to graduate or to be successful in school. And so we've, it, it makes such a difference and an impact on those families that have, that have experienced it. So um, great job to you folks for, for leading that effort. So thank you. Yes, thank you. And, and I think we had a parent come to our school committee meeting one time and talk very specifically about yep. some concerns that his daughter had and that the bridge program was very important, very important. Okay, Ms. Conan. Thank you so much for your time this evening. We really appreciate it and the questions and thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thanks guys. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, I'm gonna jump around on the agenda a little bit tonight, but I'm gonna go back to continued business and ask Dr. Daly to present about COVID-19 updates. Just wanted to share on, on three uh, points. I guess the first would be just a, a, a testing update. We did, um, we have worked with the ADECO company. We have hired one of our school nurses is now working as a project coordinator through ADECO, which has been fantastic. She's done, this is uh, Elizabeth Steele. She's done a fantastic job for us. Um, I mean, you know, calling me on and, and contacting families on Thanksgiving day to give them updates. I mean, just going above and beyond without really being asked to. Um, so she's just done an amazing job. And now as, as that liaison has just bridged a gap that are many, many districts that are struggling with some of these uh, challenges with the, the, you know, working with multiple vendors and companies, she's really bridged that gap for us. She's a parent in the district as well as an employee and it's, she's been fantastic. Colleen Reska is our lead nurse and all of our nurses just being um, outstanding with, with all the extra work. We have hired a few other folks to help with pool testing. Um, and the programs continue to work. Pooled testing has identified a few positive cases, so we're able to get out ahead of that. Test and stay has continues to allow more students to continue, but for the first time now we've seen a few of our test and stay cases um, who are then positive. So that then leads to another round of contact tracing within the school. So again, the testing allows them to stay, but then it also allows us to get out ahead of, of um, increases in numbers. So some slight possibility that there could be transmission in those contact traces, but it's also inconclusive in that the same people that have been identified are also contacts outside of school and other areas. So it's not, um, I'm not comfortable saying there's been zero signs of transmission at this point, but um, there has been uh, a few cases where close contacts have also tested positive. The numbers were, were surprising. I, I've been sharing them out. Um, but up through the middle of November, we, we had gone to, um, to five cases in October. Um, There's 22 student cases in September and two staff members. In October, there was five and five. Up through um, the first couple of weeks of November, there were uh, two cases, I believe. We are now, as we're coming to the end of November, we're 26 student cases. So we've had quite a few um, student cases and they're coming from all different um, areas and, and th there's no real clear, um, you know, outbreak or sign or so, you know, it's just here and there positive cases um, and we are staying proactive with the testing. But again, um, students who are vaccinated, students who are, um, who are testing and doing tests and stay are able to continue in school. We did clarify and we are uh, adjusting a little bit our practice because technically, if you're within six feet of someone, you are a close contact, but because if both people are masked or if one person is, I'm sorry, if the, the close contact is vaccinated, they are not subject to quarantine. Um, and so, what we are making sure we're doing though is we're still going to alert everybody um, even if they're not considered for quarantine just that they are a close contact because you may make a different decision about travel or or visiting with someone um, so that you know there's a case where you could be sitting close to someone during the school day but because both people are masked um, you're not a close contact and then you may hear that oh that person was positive and you're like but i was sitting so that communication we just felt was important. So that's something we're doing um, as just an additional step. 
in, um, in response to some scenarios that have played out. So the numbers, um, you know, are a little bit higher. The staff numbers have been consistently low. Uh, two staff members in September, five in October, and four so far this month. It was, that includes one that came across today. Um, and so, you know, that, that's been good. There's definitely uh, much lower numbers there. We are, you know, the third part just update on, from, from my understanding, we are approaching a January 15th extension of the mask, um, the mask requirement. Um, from, from everything that I'm sensing is that that may be the last piece of it. We'll see what comes up with numbers or dates or, you know, um, any, anything new that comes out in the news. But I think the real message that I'm hearing from the state is that, you know, trying to encourage vaccinations for anyone who is eligible. And at that point by January, everyone will have had the opportunity to be vaccinated from ages five and up. And so at that point, um, they will be considering whether there is a need for a mandate or whether there is, you know, at least the, maybe the ability to go back to where we were in August, where, you know, it's recommended um, for people who are unvaccinated and, 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 you know, not required. And so I think we're gonna see more guidance coming out in January about whether those thresholds are there. I think that's part of the, what, what I'm constantly wrestling with is, is the messaging on both sides. I think a lot of people have in their heads, well, we're not at 80% yet, so we're not safe, you know, as opposed to the 80% threshold was an incentive to get more people vaccinated to unmask earlier. That's sort of how it was packaged. And so I think there needs to be messaging about um, that it's not necessarily unsafe if the school is not at 80 percent threshold we may never get to that level if people choose not to be vaccinated um, and yet you know i think that again at some point the mass will will come off so i think we have to we have to be thinking about that you know i'm starting to get emails um, from people and different questions about it so my understanding from where i'm at and what i've discussed with um, when I've had the opportunity is that, you know, the January, we may see that that is sort of the end of the, the mask extension um, because people will have had that opportunity. So that's where I've, that's where I've heard at the moment, but, you know, things, things have been subject to change as we know throughout this. So. Okay. Questions Comments, or updates? Questions, anyone? I think we can keep most of that till we have more updates. So thank you very much. <coughs> <Thank you. coughs> We'll jump. I guess we'll just go in order. Number two, uh, do you want to report on the, I don't know if it's you or Michael, about the elementary and secondary school emergency relief funds? Sure. I, fund? I can just share an update on that. So we've presented this. <coughs> it's been, um, you know, um, you've given your, your approval sort of without a vote on our fund, on the budget. We've shared here exactly what our intentions were, as you recall. We were required to do a survey of all stakeholders about how we we're going to spend the funds. We've posted that on our website. We sort of followed all those motions. I don't believe that it's officially required to have a, a vote on this, but uh, in, in checking with some others, um, I felt that it was not a bad thing to do just to officially have a motion to approve ESSER 2 and then ESSER 3 funds as two separate motions. Um, we can provide more detail if you'd like, but we did go over it at the last meeting sort of in detail about. Um, how the 211.96 would be spent for ESSER 2 and the 451.952. In a quick summary, it's a lot of it is positions. We don't have as much um, funding as many other districts. We focused on a lot with positions. The, the school adjustment counselors that were mentioned there, sustaining those positions, as well as sustaining our nursing positions and our technology positions that were added to assist with COVID is the majority of those funds, Michael, right? I would say for basically over the next uh, several years. So unless you require some uh, more detail at this time, I don't know if someone would make a motion to approve so, those. So I, I would just add in there also that <coughs> we, we have approved the budget in the past and we have incorporated these funds as part of the overall budget in the past. So, you know, and we will do it again this year when we pass a budget. I think that's important that <coughs> I see some districts that are just saying, oh, I have to approve how I'm going to use these funds. I just think it's important to point out that North Reading has known about these funds and we put them into the budget. So we're not we're not just spending money fruit, you know, that we have to spend. And we're not it's not just an ill-conceived thing. It's part of the budget planning that we've been doing. So it's not new. 
Yes, we, we've known about these funds. We've been able to anticipate them and try to, you know, strategically use them to the best advantage of our district going forward. So, um, any questions about this? If not, can I entertain? Well, there's two motions here. First is a motion to approve the yep. ESSER two funds. I move to vote that the committee vote to approve the district's plan for ESSER two funds in the amount of two hundred eleven thousand ninety six dollars. I second. Any discussion or questions? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous, 5-0. And I move that the committee vote to approve the district's plan for ESSER three funds in the amount of $451,952. Second. Again, any questions, concerns? Okay, hearing none. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous, passes 5-0. Okay, thank you, Dr. Daly. <coughs> and you're on the deck again, uh, NRPS 2025 update. Great, thank you. Just share the screen here. Just wanted to give a, an overview, an update. I gave a few meetings prior. Just wanted to check in with where we are tonight in November 29th. And just a quick um, update that, you know, during the process for creating the, the plan back in the summer of retreat of 2020, we identified our big rocks of teaching and learning, equity, and student support services. And we use those big rocks for budgetary purposes and goal alignment for FY22. Um, we completed the back to the future visioning process and the during the spring and summer of 2021. And we discussed this throughout our leadership retreat over the summer, this past summer. And we made drafts of the plan in its various stages, were available as school administrators align their school improvement plans, developed administrator and educator goals, and you know, we're using it now for the process for the budget development. So we 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 can speak to NRPS 2025 positions um, as it's being developed. Even though there's not a completed bound printed document, which there may never be by the way, it may be all virtual, but you know, it's not a, a polished document yet. It's in process, but we're taking it slow. But we're doing it together. We're doing it methodically. But we're still, we're still using it as it's uh, being built. Um, as I mentioned, there's three big rocks. There are under that 24 indicators, and under those indicators are the strategic initiatives. So just a quick overview of a few things that we're doing right now. These are the 24 indicators, and we've broken this out here a little bit um, at our central office level where and you can just see that we've highlighted some of the folks that are working on it. Some of our, our names are in there. Um, and the green, this represents about two thirds of the document at this stage. I wouldn't say they're 100% done, the ones that are green, but they are most of the way done. Um, basically, you know, very close to being ready to be shared out for approval. And then there's uh, another third that we're still working on in our, in our groups. So we're coming together. This is the work that we're doing. So this is how it breaks out, similar to what you've seen before. I, I don't expect for anyone to be able to read this. This is just more to show you the format from a from a 30,000 foot view. But essentially, um, what you'll see, the indicators there, the arrows will come up. The indicator column, um, we did name everything. So this is like student services 3.1. This particular um, focus area is about cybersecurity. The next column then is the, um, the school year. So you can see there's, there's one for each of the school years leading up to 2025. The purple would show from the visioning process shows where we were in the beginning, where we are in prior to, to the, the new cycle. And the blue at the bottom is where we want to be in the future. So the, the middle columns is what we're filling in now as a team, trying to brainstorm about what these next steps are to get to where we want to be. So that's what is in this column here. So we're just outlining some of the initiatives. For example, for cybersecurity for, for next year, we're talking about um, applying for a, a continuation of the grant, the digital learning team beginning to identify areas of the curriculum where cybersecurity lessons can be included K-12. Digital learning team also identifying uh, modules for student learning, including data privacy, and then you know, providing you know, information to <coughs> parents. So, you know, those are just some examples there. Then we talk about who's responsible, so identifying who might be responsible for these different initiatives to be to be seen through. 
the resources that are involved. So, for example, grant opportunities, professional development funds, time, and funds to develop modules and assessments. Then we talk about the outcome, which is more of a philosophical idea. So something like students and staff were more knowledgeable about cyber threats. So what is that measurable outcome? But then also the measurable output, something like um, you know, 100% of staff complete the pre-assessment and the post-assessment and the phishing simulation. So the output is something more quantifiable, um, something you can hold in your hand that's more tangible. It might be survey data, it might be a published document, it might be um, reports, um, and the outcome is more philosophical. So we brainstorm both, you know, how are we going to measure this in, in multiple different ways. And then we have another column where we think about what are the related objectives. So again, that first column are the indicators. And we brainstorm and try to connect the dots between some related objectives where this may come up in different places again. And that kind of the shorthand with the code, people have responded well to because they're able to tag, we'll call it, in their own goals or their school improvement goals. And we get to see some alignment there. So we're, we're rolling these out. Each of these is 24. This is another one on diversity of workforce hiring practices that we've worked on. And just as another example, this is an earlier version of one around uh, digital learning and technology. It's sort of, you know, there's just brainstorming and it's very cumbersome and then we sort of pull it out, fine tune it, refine it, format it. So those, those are the stages that we're in and we're moving through at this point. So our next steps, uh, we are continuing to develop this draft with the team during the fall. And we're, you know, the draft in process, we're using this as the driver for budgetary purposes. And we've also used it for a lot of goal alignment for this year as well. Um, our plan is to share this with the extended leadership team of the school committee in a draft form um, in, in the winter, early winter 2022. And then we would then share it with the larger community for feedback on, on this, and then hopefully by publishing in the spring. And then it's an ongoing, it's a living document that we'd be reviewing and revising in the summer as needed. And then for the fall and leading into the fall, we'll be able to fully align, you know, have fully aligned improvement plans and administrator and education educator goals. So that's where we are. We're just moving through it. It's, it's a different process, like because we've really, I've really delegated a lot. And, and so we're trying to, you know, I, I've asked the team whether we want to move faster, do we want to do it differently, but everyone, Seems to like the pace. We're being methodical about it. We're workshopping it, brainstorming, coming back together. We're cross-teaming. You know, Cynthia may work with Sean on one, and then Dan and Sean on another, and Cynthia and Dan on another. And so we're kind of working collaboratively. Um, we met we met earlier today even, um, with our central office team. So any questions about process? Questions. My only two questions are one, you kind of addressed a couple times, but I'll ask it anyways. Is there a specific date in mind that we hope to have this done by other than 2025? <laughs> yeah, no, the, the spring, the pub, publish the a plan, okay. to have it sort of as a published right. document. It's just taken longer because of all the COVID stuff we've had. Yeah. So, you know, this typically would have been, you know, come out of the summer, been done in the fall, and there's just so many other things that everyone's doing. So I'm trying to do it at a pace yeah. where like we can all invest in it, we can be a part of it, but it can't be exhaustive either. I can't say to people, let's just give up everything and finish this right now. Um, people have a, a certain capacity to do this. So we've we've done a few extended leadership meetings. We've done a few professional days where we spent some time on it. But I'd rather do it well than, than try to rush it through. Uh, and the only other question is, this is obviously it's ultimately your, your plan, your responsibility with the other administrators. Is there any... Is there any part where other groups like the, the union or the school committee or any other entities would be part of this as well? Or is this primarily just the administrators doing it? Or is there a part for union leadership or the school committee or others to, sure. to do a piece of it? So I would say the visioning process, everyone was invited. We had, we had contributions from everyone. And this, you know, when we give it to the school community for feedback, that would be open to everyone. So. Extended leadership team would include the teacher leaders as well, who are, who are all union members. Um, and then when it's shared with the entire school community, that would be all the paraprofessionals and, and all our different uh, staff members, as well as parents and community members. Um, because I, I want people to be able to give feedback on whether they see the things that they mentioned through the visioning process, 
are they seeing them in there or not, or do they see them represented in the way that they that they wanted to see? Um, and we will take that feedback and then and then make adjustments as, as needed. It doesn't, you know, I, I think what I have to keep reminding people is it's not always going to be everything that everybody wants in there because part of what we're doing is trying to figure out what we can actually do within this cycle. But I do really hope to, especially people who took the time to complete the process, put in their information, uh, and participate in the, in the process, I really want to make sure that something of what they have in there is represented in a way that we can actually achieve it. And, and, and I was not in any way saying it has to be a different way. I think you, you did a lot of effort to include people in the very beginning. It's very hard to manage too many people in doing it, and so I think the administrator might be the right group. I was just more opening asking the questions. I saw the beginning and the end, this in the middle, if there's any you know, involvement of anybody beyond the administrators, and it, it, wasn't a, it wasn't a leading question in any way. I just wanted to be clear. Perfect. Thank you very much. I don't think we need a vote on this yet. Correct? Okay. <coughs> Enrollment projection. Mr. Connolly. <coughs> Just want to share. Yeah. Very good. So there, there was a lot of information in your packet, um, similarly to what we've kind of shared in the past around this time. Once the October one um, enrollment is certified for the current school year, that's sort of the driving data that we use to to look to the future. So I'm going to try to just kind of move through things relatively quickly um, and, and touch upon some highlights of what's been shared in the reports that have been put together. Um, this is the process we go through on an annual basis. What's really driving the projections and, and the analysis that goes into the report and the data is certainly what's happened in the past and you review the trends from a three-year, five-year, ten-year models. You look at um, the number of students that are kind of progressing from grade level to grade level. You look at census data, you look at residential developments, the economy, the market, you know, a variety of, of, of data, um, including historical trends and census, and kind of what's happening within from the, you know, the macro level, from, from the geographically in the region, geographically, as well as obviously from a micro level, what's happening within North Reading to try to develop the projections, and generally, um, we can certainly predict enrollment um, pretty accurately with with looking at the trends in the census data. We can certainly get get down to sort of a less than a one percent variance from from when we look at our projections to actuals from year to year. So we'll look at historical data, the projected data, and then I think we'll look at enrollment projections at level and school, and ultimately. This all leads to what is the impact on staffing in the budget, and we'll, I plan to touch upon that um, at the end of the presentation. So, historical enrollment, you can kind of look at what we're, what we, where we've been over the last 50 some odd years. It sort of looks like two bell curves. We've been um, slowly on a moderate decline um, since about 2008, with some slight exceptions in there um, in, a, in a given year. I think based on uh, some of the evidence that we're seeing with um, developments in the community, with certainly birth data, with in-migration kind of coming back to, to North Reading. I think there's been some turnover in homes that have, have increased. And, um, with all that data and that trend, it's looking like we're going to start to experience um, kind of a moderate increase over the next five to ten years. So that's, um, I think you'll start to see, we have about a 12 student increase this year, and I think you'll start to see some increases as the projections indicate. So here's that history. We're at 2,321 students, uh, up from 2,309 a year ago. Relatively stable. Not, you know, we've certainly had that decline from 2,606 um, in 2013, about 10 years ago, and it's been on a moderate steady decline since. But as I said, you're going to start to see these the enrollment kind of increase back up to around 2,500 students over the next 10 years. Um, and here's that projection, that high-level projection. Um, so the five-year data, we're at 2,442. This is on a pre-K through 12 level. Um, 
And then 10 year data, we're up again, getting close to that, you know, over 25, 50 projection. So you're going to see what the previous decade, sort of a moderate decline. I think that at least right now, the projected over the next 10 years is that moderate increase. The driving factors here is the economy and real estate situation continues to improve in the region. Um, there's evidence of um, new families moving in with school age children. And all of this is leading to um, evidence that there's going to be sort of an increase over the next decade. Um, back to levels we, that we saw in 2014 and 2015, um, about six, seven years ago. So we look at it amongst each level. Um, the elementary level, um, green is actuals, blue is projections. I think you're going to see sort of an increase um, over the next five years at the elementary level. What's really driving that is, I think, certainly census data, birth rates. You're going to see an uptick at the kindergarten level and as the higher class sizes come in, you'll see that increase move through the grade level. Um, so you'll certainly see an increase which will lead to a need for some additional staffing, certainly over the next few years. Um, middle school, I think, is relatively stabilizing. We're at 564. Currently, we are projecting um, a slight decrease next year, and it's going to kind of stabilize. There's a smaller cohort that will kind of enter grade six, so it'll dip for one year and then kind of go back. And I think we're really looking at it a stable, stabilizing around between 540 and 555 students over the next five years. So it shouldn't have a major impact on staffing at the middle school level. High school, uh, we're at 639. We're expected to see an increase next year. Um, and then it will kind of stabilize. And then we'll start to see it tick upwards to around 680 students and start to kind of level out um, at about that number. Um, over the next um, three to five years. So, shouldn't, again, shouldn't see a huge impact on staffing um, as these numbers begin to stabilize. So, I think the biggest staffing need, at least in the near future, would be at the elementary level. Um, so, again, it's just another way of looking at the, at the numbers. But certainly, um, as I mentioned earlier, elementary school enrollment with increase in kindergarten as new <coughs> New, student, new families show evidence of kind of purchasing homes and the, the turnover of homes have increased will certainly impact enrollment at the elementary level over the next five years. Middle school and high school will experience very moderate changes and in, in increases or decreases over the next three to five years. Um, again, it's important we look at these patents on an annual basis and look at all this data annually as we typically do as these patents will change. And we'll continue to review trends, census data, the, the, mark, the economy, the real estate market, developments within the community. There are some developments that could impact some of these numbers that are projected to come online over the next few years. So we'll continue to, to monitor, monitor this on an annual basis, as we typically do. Um, and then I think the, the other piece of information that I think it's important we look at that was shared in the report is when we get, this is really to me the kind of the beginning of the budget process and enrollment. When we look at putting together a level services budget. We always want to look at the changes in staffing and enrollment. And there's a lot of data here that I just kind of went through on a very high level summary that you can review. Um, but I think when we get to the budget process, we certainly analyze sort of certainly this impact for next year and, and what's happening with the the cohorts and as students move from grade to grade, when you look at it by school, um, and I, I think the, the biggest area is at the kindergarten level, we're expected to see an increase in kindergarten students, mainly driven by the census data and the birth rates from five or six years earlier. So um, kindergarten is not the most difficult number to project, um, but we, we know we're going to see have a need there for at least um, additional staffing, what that looks like in terms of half day, full day, is certainly won't be known until later in the year, but we, we know there'll be a need for additional staffing at the kindergarten level, um, which is reflected here at the, hood, at the hood school. And then at the little school, we see a reflection again, probably at the kindergarten level, getting to about 1.0 1, 1 FTE. Um, there was kind of a typo on the report. Um, 
We're currently carrying one section in grade three at the little, but the plan for next year is to move back to two sections. Um, and so this would actually show uh, 13 and 13, not 26. Um, it's not going to have an impact on staffing because currently there's sort of an academic interventionist position. That's going to the plan would be to move that position back into the, the grade a grade level teaching position. So that's why that that asterisk is there. Um, but that's been uh, certainly conversations I've had with Principal Molly and Dr. Daly. That that plan is in place, and the the, the plan is to have the FY23 budget reflect that. Um, and the other need for staffing would be at the grade five. Um, at the at the little school, as a smaller cohort moves on to the middle school and a larger cohort moves to grade five, there would be a need for additional staffing. So, overall, at the elementary level, when you look at it by school, it looks like between kindergarten and the grade level fluctuations, um, there would be a need for two additional staffing positions, grade level positions, um, to maintain our optimal class sizes and to reach the guideline that we've tried to maintain over the last number number of years. Um, again, middle school, no major changes, no, no need for uh, a lot of changes here, and the same for the high school. So I know, that was, I know I went through a lot of information there very quickly, but I think there's just a lot of data and, and things that we'll analyze and get more into during the budget process. Um, but I think it's important that we start to look at this information and, re and review this certainly on, a, on an ongoing basis. And these numbers have to change even from two or three years ago. I think certainly with COVID, um, in the real estate has it had an impact on the, the real estate market. And I think many um, kind of the baby boomer generations have been encouraged to kind of put their homes in the market. And we've seen a real increase in the turnover of homes, and, um, which has started to impact these numbers as we look to the the next three to five years. Um, with that being said, I'll open it up to any questions um, from the committee. Peanut Gallery. I got a few questions, but I'm not. Let everybody else go first. Anybody? Questions? Mm -hmm. Comments? Oh, you're <laughs> looking around. Well, first, very much appreciate the two classes in the little school. I've heard lots of complaints this year from <laughs> different parents about that. I think it's Good change, so thank you. Um, the only other question on a similar one is, has there been any, I wonder if we should think about at the batch elder, there's uh, in the second grade class this year, there's 90 kids, 22, 22, 23, 23. I think a couple years ago, there was discussion about adding another section when they were younger, because if you split that at five, it would be 18. Again, I don't know if we have the, I think that was on the budget years ago. It's something that I think we should think about when we're doing the budget. I'm not saying that we should or should not, but it's the only other class that is over, you know, it is approaching that level. So that's just kind of for us in the future. I think we should think about that. Um, specific questions on the middle school. It looks like it said the class size. I think there, there was an error for next year. It looks like the class sizes are, are pretty reasonable. But um, the class sizes for yeah, because 20, 22, 23, I don't think they're all 10. I think it's probably divided by 10. <laughs> oh, yeah, but, I believe that's yeah. the, the sections, I should say. Yeah. More the over, over But what about the, the high school? I mean, I, I know the high school is one that in, in years past we've addressed, we've added a few teachers there. What is class size looking at at the high school, and how many are over, you know, are, are the very large classes? I mean, how are we doing at the high school for class size? Yeah, so we, we do look at that. Um, it's certainly certainly improved. So I, I know for years, certainly when there was a bubble that moved through there, there was certainly a lot of the advanced placement and, and high honors classes um, and some of the core subject classes that were very popular, had class sizes that were above 24, kind of in that 24 to 28 range. Um, as enrollment has ticked down and as we've kind of gotten some additional staffing over the years, uh, those numbers have significantly improved, where it, we still see some very popular sections, and some AP courses kind of higher than we like, kind of in that 26 range. Mm -hmm. But no more are we seeing that 27, 28 um, class sizes for some of those those classes that we, we once saw. So I think we are, we're certainly in a much better place. Um, 
And I think we're, you know, there's certainly some classes that are above 24 where we'd like to have them, um, but there's certainly not, not as many. The amount has gone considerably de decreased. And we can pull that data and kind of look at that. I, I, think, I think that's more for budget anyways, but yeah. I just know we've also, when we tie things together, we've, you know, we've seen some AP data in the past, and I know we want a lot of students to take them, but we've, we've made some comments about some performance in certain AP classes in the past, and I just want to make sure if it's, if, if we're putting 28 kids in an AP class and we're seeing poor performance, that we're not, that we're, that we're funding it appropriately, so. I'd be curious when we're doing the budgeting to sort of look at that as well. Um, and the only other question that I had was during COVID, I think there's been some students that have pulled out of district. There's been some students that may be doing homeschool this year. And I, I don't know the numbers of that, but can you speak at all to number one, like how that impacts enrollment and how you're projecting in the future? If that's something that we anticipate students leaving the district long term or if we're anticipating them coming back and they're still in the data, you know, in, in the numbers going forward? Yeah, it's a good qu a question. I mean, we, we saw some of that certainly last year. Um, we didn't see anywhere near the, the, the level of that as some other districts or other kind of communities um, certainly felt during during COVID. We, we definitely saw a little bit of uptick in some, some virtual schools that are offered in the state, um, you know, some of those students, and again, this is some data we'll kind of really get into a more granular level during the budget, and even when we do some other state reports a little bit later, have have showed evidence of kind of coming back. Um, but it, 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 we don't, we haven't just seen a lot of it there. I think we have a significant impact on the numbers on a on a long term basis. Is that I would say the yeah. number. There was a handful of students that beyond the traditional number of homeschool students last year and those students have mostly all returned. Mm -hmm. Our numbers, uh, I believe we have fewer homeschool students this year than we have in a typical year. So it's, it's not, a, uh, we're at 10, 10 students this year. Well, there, I mean, again, it, it, the numbers are small enough that even if they, if, if somebody came back or if you stayed out, I mean, it'd be a minimal impact for class sizes at any of the levels. Right. That's why I that's why I thought that you wanted at least to advance that. Okay. Any other questions? Great question. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Connolly. Okay. <coughs> Moving on. <coughs> Next thing on here is the superintendent. So I will take this to start. <coughs> I would just like to say that I have been thoroughly impressed with the job that Dr. Daly has been doing. We talked about it during his review. We talked about it at other meetings, but I cannot stress enough how happy I have been with your leadership throughout this pandemic and just overall. I mean, it, we sometimes forget that you've really only been in this position for about a year and a half right now. And we also see some of the problems going on elsewhere. We saw firsthand when we did, you know, an open search. And if people remember, we did, we, we didn't just hand you the job. Even though you were the, you were, you were the assistant superintendent and had, by all, by all accounts, had done an excellent job in that role, we didn't want to just hand you the position. We looked around, and you were by far the best candidate for this position. And so I know I speak for the rest of the committee when I say that we would like to keep you here for a very long time in the future. Your contract officially runs for, an, for the rest of this year and then next year, but we thought that it was important enough to show the you know the continuity going forward that we wanted to you know begin some discussions and you know in the past couple of months about extending you and we also felt that you know throughout you know doing some comparison analysis you know Mr. Conley was very very helpful in you know pulling some data we also realized that the market has shifted a bit and so we wanted to really be fair to you in doing that and so with that in mind we have met a few times um, and we as you know you and I have had some meetings and I think we have an agreement for an extension which would you know it would uh, do a slight market adjustment over the next two years and then 
the solos would be consistent with the teachers' union contract that we negotiated at the end of last year. And we would like to hopefully have you extended through the end through June 30th, 2026 with the new contract. Does anybody else have any comments or thoughts or questions? I never doubt it, this <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Mrs. Imbriano was a main deterrent, but you know, we still. <laughs> okay. Well, with that being said, we would like, to, I would like to have a motion to approve the new contract with Dr. Daly, which includes an extension of another three years. I move that we approve that contract. That's a step. Okay. Any comments? Any questions? Any discussion? Okay. Hearing none. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. Thank you very much, Dr. Daly. Thank you so much. I, I'm very happy um, in this position. It's been a little different than I expected, but I've, I've really enjoyed it. Just as welcoming, and, and the team that I have around me is incredible. Starting with Michael and Sean and Cynthia and Dan, central office, and our principals and teachers, staff, everyone, parents, children. This is a wonderful place to work. I tell everyone on opening day, I tell all the new teachers we hire, this is a great, great place to work. And I've been very happy here for the last 13 years, and I, I hope to, to be here for quite some time. So I really appreciate the, the kindness and the extension. Thank you so much. And, and I think that you should not expect this every year on your birthday. <laughs> we can give you a cake other years, but um, this year I think is is very warranted. And your comments really lead us into the next thing because we also agree that you have great people around you. We agree that the administration as a whole here is you know, a really top-notch staff. Um, it's funny when we were looking for superintendent, I think all of the other candidates that we thought of had, were actually within the district. You know, when we had the assistant superintendent position open, again, we saw the same thing. We saw fantastic candidates within here. Um, and so with that being said, we also would like to clean up and extend some of your lieutenants here. And so specifically, we would like to do extensions for the both assistant superintendents, Michael Connelly and also Sean Colleen, and the principals whose contracts are ending soon, which is Dr. O'Connell at the middle school, Mrs. Molly at the little school, Mr. Maloney at the um, at the bachelor school. So if there's no, no comments or thoughts, if I could have a, mo a motion to extend in a, uh, those contracts. I move that we extend those contracts. <laughs> what do you want to why don't we, I think we have this. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to give this to you just so we can be very clear. I, 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 I agree. Uh, I move Why don't you move again? I remove to approve the superintendent's recommendations for contract extensions for the following administrators. Assistant Superintendent of Finance and Operations, Michael Colony, excuse me, Connolly. Assistant Superintendent of Teaching and Learning, Sean Colleen. North Reading Middle School Principal, Catherine O'Connell. ESL Little School Principal, Christine Molly. And... LD Batchelder Principal Michael Maloney. And I'll second that. Okay. Do you want to repeat it for clarity? <laughs> no, no, good. Yeah, I mean, I just think I, I cannot emphasize enough how important leadership is. We've said this before from this committee, and we very much believe that. We think having the right people here is what has helped get us through this pandemic, and you know, it's not going away anytime soon. There's a lot more to get to go, so it's important to have the right people in place. So. Okay, any other comments, thoughts, discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Opposed? Unanimous. Aye, zero. Thank you very much. And thank you, Dr. Daly, for negotiating those because those are your hires. So just so people are clear, we the school committee has some say in two positions. Mr. Uh, the, the whoever's in charge of the finance, which here is, you know, the assistant superintendent, Mr. Connolly, and also, we have some say in the person in charge of student services, specifically special education, which is Cynthia Conant. Um, but beyond that, we really hire and, and oversee one person, which is Dr. Daly. And Dr. Daly is the one that is really in charge of developing and hiring and retaining the, the great administrators here. So all the credit really does go to, obviously, the individuals, but also Dr. Daly for his supervision of those people. So thank you.
Okay, <clears throat> with all that done, move on to minutes. We have one set of minutes. You know, Mrs. Imbriano left this <laughs> left this last year. Sorry last about that. And actually, the November 9th, were you not there at this one? I did not. I was not. <laughs> Do you want to make the motion? I will make the motion. Okay. There we go. Um, I make a motion to accept the open session minutes of November 8, 2021, and I will go with that they are done correctly. And was it November 8th or November 9th? That's why I said November 8th because it's written. Okay. It is November 8th that we were there. Okay. Is there a second? Okay. Second from Diana. Any comments, any changes? Are you going to abstain from your own motion? I am. <laughs> okay. So all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? And then abstention? That's One abstention. So it passes 4 to 0. This is Embriano abstaining. <clears throat> okay, moving on. Budget update, Mr. Connolly. Yes, thank you. Um, so there is an update um, this evening in the form of the Student Activity Quarter 1 report. So we have um, completed the end of the first quarter of fiscal 22, um, which reflects activity really through July 1st um, through September 30th, 2021. So we've been able to certainly certify all the uh, account balances, are uh, reconciled with the bank balances for the elementary schools, as well as the middle school and the high school, as well as the various um, sub-account activity that exists at the middle school and the high school. So consistent with previous um, student activity quarterly report updates, you can see the, the various balances of the five schools and then the, the high school and middle school um, sub-account balances of the clubs and activities are reflected in the report. Um, also consistent with um, our policy as well as with um, recommended best practices, um, we are asking, I am going to ask that the committee take a vote to approve the list of active student activity accounts that are reflected at the high school and the middle school um, on, the, on those lists in the report this evening. And that, that's something that's recommended by um, our auditors and it's something that they're going to be looking for that a motion was taken to officially approve those, those accounts. Perfect. Thank you very much. So question. <laughs> um, just a little bit. So, like, just for instance, when the culinary club starts up next year, it will be reflected on this. It will. So, if they, if they, if they get certainly financial activity, we would certainly add them, and they would be reflected on the report. Okay. Yeah. I have three questions, Mr. Connolly. <laughs> First one: Why is the class of 2022 so low? Is there anything else? Um, anything but. Usually, the, usually the, the classes that are about to graduate sooner have higher balances. Class of 2021 is at 9,000 still. 23 and 24 at 3,000 and 4,800 respectively. Mm -hmm. Class of 22 is only at $835. I'm just curious why that is so low, if you know. Yeah, I don't, I don't know all the details behind that. I mean, I don't know if it's related to you know, last year. I know there wasn't a lot of activity in general that, that went on because of the pandemics, I don't know if it's related to um, anything to do with, you know, what we've come in the last year and a half yeah. with, with activity and fundraising activity, but it could be a timing thing. They could they could have um, kind of a large deposit based on the fundraiser that was done, um, waiting waiting to be deposited. I, I, mean, I, I, also, I also know that there was like, because I saw a student fundraiser, fundraiser going out for the, student, for the senior class. And I don't know if that would go through this or if there's a separate this fundraiser. This is at 9.30, first of all. Okay. This is as of, this is as of September 30th. 30th. But I know there was some fundraising going on, but is that, would that, would that possibly be separate? Uh, if there's an approved fundraising law for the senior class, it should flow through this account. Okay. Yeah. Sure. I'm just curious because I, I thought the fundraiser stuff and a donation to the senior class. I'm just curious. Um, second question is, about what is the field trip? Is that an actual club or is that for? So those are the general field trips that exist for all the classes. So if there's an improved field trip um, that the 10th grade history class is doing, that that activity flows through here. Okay. And then the, la the last question is, not, is 
not really related to the budget part, but I, I know in the past few years there have been some issues with the yearbook in the past, and since where we have the budget here, I'm just curious, has there been any changes made to the club this year just to address some of those issues? Because I know that, again, this year your yearbook is very much an important part of a lot of students' lives, and I just really like to get things corrected so we don't see hear those issues again coming up. And I was just looking through the clubs and I saw the yearbook there, and I'm wondering if there's been any adjustments made I have addressed this to Mr. LaPrette recently as a week or so ago and just to make sure that he and the advisor were going to be very clear, very sure about I mean, errors do happen, but um, you know, they're going to be extra, extra careful with those specific issues that happened last year, but that does not happen again. Uh, so he did assure me that, that has already, there's already been several steps taken this year proactively to proof everything and make sure that those issues don't. And, and again, I mean, they're not specifically going to the school committee, but to the extent that there's, if there was, we needed another advisor on it, if we needed, you know, to hire an editor or something like that, I, I just think, I want to make sure we know about it in advance so that we don't have the issues continue to happen. And if there is a funding, if there's a need for a second advisor or something like that, I would very much like to, you know, see that presented rather than continue to have errors in the year before. I will I will share that you know one through conversations last year it's not an easy position to fill even with one person because of the time commitment and the hours and that uh, there's a lot of moving parts with your book and so uh, but I appreciate that suggestion we can consider that uh, but I know that the person uh, that's doing it is really paying close attention to those things and as she always has but even more so this year. Well, and, and, so, yeah. It's got to be hard for one person to do it. So having a second set of eyes to edit has to be helpful. So if there's, again, if there's something that needs to be done, I just think it's important that we... And just remember, too, the majority of this is being done by the students as well. So yeah. students are the ones that are monitoring and checking and all those things. And the advisors sort of making sure the students are hitting their mark yeah. as well. So uh, when mistakes happen, often student editors are also making mistakes. So as a team, as a structure, they're really, you know, examining what happened and trying to, to, to make sure it doesn't happen. Again, I, know, I know that's a detour of what we're really yeah. doing tonight, but it's one of the only times that we look at the clubs that are happening. So, And, you know, the other piece that I did follow up, you know, the issues were addressed. The, the parents, to, to my knowledge, with my conversation with Mr. LaPrez, the parents were satisfied with what was done with reissuing of of uh, your books and things last year. So I think it was addressed for last year and it's certainly being addressed proactively this year. Thank you very much. Okay. My question's done. Um, does anybody like to make a motion to approve the list of active student activity accounts? Yes. I move that we approve the list of student activity accounts at the high school and middle school for this 2021. How about but I have a motion that the school committee vote to approve the list of active student activity accounts at high school and middle school for the 2021-2022 school year as presented by the administration. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, 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 my no, no, no. I just get loose with something. I'm looking at something. And I have a second. Second. Oh, second by Janine. Okay. Any comments? Questions? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. Don't you show know. the auditors or the whoever's examining the case. <laughs> yes, right. Yes. Yeah. Okay, no staffing adjustments at this time, Dr. Daly? Not at this time. There's a donation. That was my last. But we have a couple. Um, I move that the school committee votes to accept the gratitude a donation of $2,000 from the Special Olympics of, Ma of Massachusetts to benefit the special education program at the high school. Second. Very kind of them. Comments, questions? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Yeah. And I move that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude a donation of general office supplies valued at $500 from North Reading resident Greg Embriano to benefit all schools and offices across the district. Uh, second. Is that right? Relation, I assume? Very nice. Yeah, Thank you very much. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? 
Unanimous, right? No oh, expense in there. But yeah. It's gonna make a joke. It said it's so name wrong. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <coughs> Subcommittee update. None of this time. No subcommittees are getting no subcommittees are between this meeting and my knowledge. Okay. Subcommittee schedule. Apparently the finance planning team is meeting December third. I think it's probably not schedule. Fine Arts Subcommittee is meeting December 8th, 3.15 p.m., and the Athletic Subcommittee is meeting on December 15th. For the Administrator Report, Dr. Daly. Just a few items to share. I, you know, it was mentioned earlier, it's, uh, it's a really exciting time at the high school and for the whole community with our, with our football team advancing to Gillette Stadium this week. Um, it's just, it's, it's such a great atmosphere in the building, just uh, the excitement level for this high level of competition that's just really, uh, new and exciting for, for all the students, especially those um, on the team, the cheerleading team, the, the band that's a part of this. It's, it's a great uh, opportunity. So we're very excited for those, for those folks. And um, just to address, too, I know as we came in, there's the scaffolding outside of the area here. There were some um, some water issues that we had on the third floor. And so uh, Mr. Connolly and our director of facilities, um, Mr. Campagna, addressed that right away um, through the proper channels. We have a scaffolding up there. They performed all the mitigation. Um, the report was uh, that what they found was just some damaged drywall. There was really no issues. Uh, I don't know if there's anything to expand on, Michael. Uh, but they've actually already you know, checked it, inspected it. It looks good. They've uh, repaired the drywall and the scaffolding is prepared to come down. We are still trying to Further examine the, the overall. Um, this is right under the skylight, so we're trying to figure out the relationship between the skylight and the and, and the leak. And there are some ongoing. There are some certainly some strategies that we have going, but there's sort of a bigger investigation just to make sure we address the, the root cause. And if you've ever had a skylight, trying to figure out exactly the root cause can be a, a time-consuming process. But I don't know if there's anything you want to add to that, Michael. Or? Uh, no, I think that covers it. So the the skylight. Well, we're continue to investigate the root cause. The skylight's been kind of wrapped uh, and secured to, to prevent any further you know, damage while the mitigation and repair work is done. So I just, you know, hopefully we'll get to the bottom of it and um, address it as, as soon as possible. So. But, uh, just because of the structure, just the, mm -hmm. it has to go out there. Just um, But we did it. It was very, very safe, very orderly, and uh, it was well done and, and timely. And, and I, 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 I do think you should have just put an advertisement for Newsies on it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. That's true. Is that all? That's all. Perfect. Thank you. Um, future business, just a note for anybody that is listening. Um, we did have a meeting scheduled for next week. We have canceled that meeting. There wasn't that much on the agenda, and we added it to tonight's agenda instead. So the next meeting of the school committee will be January 10th, 2022. So. Happy uh, holidays, everybody, and uh, hopefully we uh, have a good new year. Um, and then the next meeting is January 24th, 2022. Watch you. Thank now, you. for the next meeting, are we still doing everything here? We're not going to local schools still, right? I assume. The, the, certainly the middle school will be here. Yeah. Um, the question of whether they're in person or not, I would probably give them the option um, to either be remote or in person like we did last year. I think they, we did a little bit of both. Yeah. Um, I don't believe we would be going to the little school, okay. uh, but I can I can ask. Uh, I, I'm just curious. I, I know in, in years past we've done that, but I don't yeah. know what we're doing. But yeah, I would okay. check with Miss Molly about what she would prefer. Uh, I think <coughs> we could do it. I think all the equipment and everything. I believe we could. Uh, and we could theoretically still do it with uh, with a Google Meet and everything from. Cool. We could, um, yep. we could do it either. Way. Last year, I know that we did it here, and they were at their school. Right. They may choose to do it that way as well. Yep. Um, honestly, I think it worked fairly well either way. I think yeah. in person is always nice, but we'll see what uh, what, what they're most comfortable with for this year. I think would be would be best. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Um, if there's nothing else, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. I so need. And by Mr. McGowan, second. <laughs> Second Aye. by James Byers and All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. Happy birthday, Dr. Daly. Thank you so much. Have a good night.